The story of Oedipus, if you remember this from school, is that a son kills his father, marries his mother, and he does all of this without ever intending to. Well, this next story is also about a family getting ripped apart, and the son ends up with the mother. And in this story, as in the story of Oedipus, the tragedy is that nobody wants it to work out this way. In fact, they all want it to work out differently. Nancy Updike tells the story of a family and, like the story of Oedipus, of what it means to be a man. This story is like one of those Russian dolls where there's always a smaller one inside. The smallest doll, the core of the drama, is the fact that Mubarak, a childhood sissy, grew up to be a different kind of sissy than his father. His father is nerdy and bookish. Mubarak's gay. Everything around that core gets bigger and bigger until finally you can't believe the biggest and the smallest have anything to do with each other. The one is so bloated and the other so tiny. At the beginning of this story, Mubarak's parents are married and in love and both prepare to live far from everything they know to be with each other. At the end of the story, they may still be in love, but they're divorced and an ocean apart and not speaking and Mubarak is caring for his mother the way a husband might. Okay, Margie Ruth. I don't get too hot. I not too good, too hot. Mubarak starts Margie's shower and he's holding on to her so she won't fall, and she's holding on to him too. She's about five feet tall, naked and fragile looking and very pale. He's dressed in jeans and a shirt that he knows are about to get really wet. All right, lift your breast. Lift one at a time so I can wash under it. Okay. Hey, Margie, was it hard the first time Mubarak gave you a shower? I got embarrassed. How did, how did you get over being embarrassed? I just called it happens over and over and over again. Mark, it's my son, you know. He gets a washcloth in under her breasts, and she stands serenely, blinking in the water. It's a moment so intimate it's hard to watch. But then, as he gets her out of the shower and is drying her off, there's another moment that makes the intimacy of everything before it seem completely beside the point and prettied up in comparison. He takes a baby wipe and wipes her butt for her. Nobody's going to give me a shot today, are they? No, we have to take some blood, though. We have to go to the lab and they're going to take some blood. Well, that's a shot. It's, it's not a shot. They're drawing yeah. blood. Well, they, they, put they stick you, but they're not giving you a shot. They're taking blood. There's a difference. You ever tried it? <laughs> Margie's only 66, but in the last couple of years, she's had a heart attack and two small strokes, which paralyzed her right arm and affected her memory. It cuts in and out like faulty wiring. Sometimes she's talkative and remembers a lot. Sometimes she's not, and she doesn't. Here, you know what? Lift your breast for me again so that we can make sure. You don't have a rash under there anymore, do you? I don't think so. Because we've got to make sure it stays dry so it doesn't get a rash under there. Mubarak, is this closer than you ever thought you'd get to an adult woman's body? <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could say that. But this is the end of the story. This is today. Let's go back to the beginning. Mubarak's family didn't really notice that he was, as he tells it, a big sissy because they were all oddballs. No matter where they were living, at least one of them was always not quite fitting in. Margie's from Georgia and lived most of her married life either up north or in the Middle East. Mubarak's father, Saber, is Palestinian, born in Jordan, but for most of the marriage, they all lived in a small town in Pennsylvania where he was a professor of civil engineering. Now, if Mubarak was a sissy and white, working-class Catholic Hershey PA, Saber was too. We got a week off of school every year because so many people, so many boys, went hunting, went deer hunting. Um, and of course, you know, I didn't go hunting and I didn't play any, you know, football and I didn't do all of those things that, you know, the boys in the neighborhood were supposed to do, especially hunting. Hunting was like, you know, a, a yardstick of when you reached manhood. Saber, meanwhile, to Mubarak's shame and horror, had to call in neighborhood dads to do simple mechanical tasks like unclogging a drain. And Margie was the one who hung their wedding pictures because Saber claimed he didn't know how to hammer a nail. No, Saber didn't do any of that stuff. I mean, Saber was always very formal. He always had a sport jacket. I remember, I remember um, 
like cutting grass was a big deal out there. Like lawn care, like how green and how even and how perfect was your yard. And then I remember Saber was in the yard cutting the grass and he was cutting the grass and he had a sport coat and a tie on. Which is funny, I mean, if you think about well, it. Well, and why would he do it? I mean, I think, that, I think that came from the Middle East idea that if you are educated, that there's a certain position that you have in society and that you should always look and act a certain way. You can see why, in this atmosphere, Sabra at one point panicked and made Margie sign Mubarak up for Little League. To toughen him up, he told her. But mostly, Margie says, Sabra worshipped Mubarak. He adored him. Mubarak this, and Mubarak that, and Mubarak the other, and everything he talked about was Mubarak. After he found out Bart was gay, he hardly ever said he wouldn't hardly even mention his name. Margie was the one who made the phone call to Mubarak after finding a bunch of gay adult cards in his room. He was 20 years old and staying with friends in Germany at the time, on his way to a semester in England. And it was, it was the middle of the night. I don't remember if we were exactly in bed. And the mother came down and said in German to my friend, um, there's a phone call from America and it's an emergency for your American friend. So I was all nervous and I went upstairs and it was Margie and she was crying. She was hysterical. And she said, I said, Margie, what's wrong? And she said, you have to come home now. And I said, why? What's wrong? And she just kept repeating, you have to come home now. And I, I kept trying to get out of her what was wrong. So she finally said, we found a good hospital in Tennessee that can cure you. And then I knew what was wrong. And of course, I told her that I wasn't coming home until the end of the semester, and I would see her in January, and I think I hung up right away. This was the beginning of their world starting to shift and become something else. Saber blamed Margie for Mubarak being gay. Saber, who never raised his voice before, would pound the table and say Mubarak was gay because he's a mama's boy. I didn't think I'd married the same person at those times. He used to be jolly and gay and cheerful and tell jokes and I didn't know him anymore. I guess he didn't know me either. He was in such bad shape that he had taken off time from the university. I think he took a whole semester off from teaching at the university. Um, he was so bad at one point, he would sit and like stare into space and not respond to conversations and questions. And they had like home health care, like an IV for him at home because he wouldn't eat. When Mubarak came home around Christmas, they all sat down at the kitchen table for a family meeting. Margie didn't say hardly anything the whole time. And neither did I actually. Saber did most of the talking. And he said, basically he started with, you know, you're our son and we love you, but this is wrong and this is an illness and there are doctors, you know, I've looked into it and there are doctors who say that if you just try, if you get help, that you can change, you know. Did he say the word homosexual? Oh God, no, he would never say that. He would say your condition or your problem or your situation. He would never say the word gay or homosexual ever, ever, ever. Like, even in the years after that, he never, ever said that word. The biggest problem with Mubarak being gay was that he would never have children. He would never have a son to carry on the family name, as Saber had done, and as Saber's father had done. This was Mubarak's obligation. After a long argument, the last thing Saber said to Mubarak was this. I remember he said, he looked at me and he said, I will sell all the land in Palestine to raise the money to send you to a doctor if you ever decide that you would go. And that's 
a, I mean, if you, you know, being Palestinian and understanding how important land is, I mean, land is identity, it's a future, it's the past, it's everything. And for Sabra to say that he would sell all of his land showed that this was really the top priority in his whole life. For two years, nothing changed. Mubarak stayed in school and kept being gay. Sabar stayed depressed and wrote Mubarak long letters saying he loved Mubarak, but Mubarak was sick and he owed it to Sabar to get help. Margie quietly began flooding Mubarak's college mailbox with condoms. Then Margie and Sabar moved back to the Middle East, as they'd always planned to do when Sabar retired. He was 65, she was 59. Six months later, everything shifted again. The family mutated again, becoming more like what it would soon be, and less like it had been before. It started with another phone call to Mubarak. Well, I mean, the way I first found out about it was I got a telephone call one afternoon from Margie. And she said, honey, do you think I could come live with you? And I was, I, I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, Margie, what are you talking about? She said, do you think I could come live with you? And then she told me that she and Saber were getting divorced because he was going to marry another woman and have another son. In fact, divorce wasn't even what Saber wanted. At first, he asked Margie if she would be his partner in what he called joint venture. I want you to help me find a young lady you think you can get along with. I said, well, what? And he said, I want to marry another woman and have a baby. I said, okay, Sauber, you better find one you think you can get along with, because I'm not going to be here. And then, you know, she went through the, that was plan A, and the plan B was having another wife at a different apartment. And then plan C was him getting married in the West Bank just going down there a couple weeks a year and then basically living with Margie and Jordan. And her response to that was always my favorite. That's when she asked him. She said, okay, that's fine as long as I can have a boyfriend. He said, why? I said, <laughs> so when you tell, ask me what I've been doing, I'll tell you the same thing you've been doing while you were over there. <laughs> he didn't appreciate that either. And I remember Saber wrote me a very, very long letter explaining what he was doing and why he was doing it and how he had been forced into doing this because for years he had been asking me to go get help and I was just ignoring him. And he felt that it was his, since I was not going to have a son to carry on the family name, that the responsibility of making sure that the family, family name survived suddenly became his again and this was the only way he could see to do it and he was very heavy on the this is your fault you're doing this to margie not me the other thing that was really strange was he spent pages saying you know try to con your mother is being very closed-minded about all of this Try to convince, try to help me convince her to stay here. She doesn't have to leave. I don't want her to leave. So Saber divorced Margie, telling her every day until she left that he loved her and didn't want her to leave. And she got on the plane and began the life she's pretty much living now. From that point on, instead of a husband, she would have a son. And from the moment the plane touched down, he treated her the way you'd want your husband to treat you. I never forget when I came back getting off the plane. You know, we got through customs and all that stuff. I saw this great big bunch of flowers somebody was holding way up in that beautiful, beautiful bunch of flowers. And I said, somebody is certainly going to get to myself a beautiful bouquet of flowers. And guess who that was? Well, any guesses? Margie moved into Mubarak's graduate school apartment which, by the way, was at the same university where Saber had taught. 
In her old life, she'd been supported by one man, her husband, the professor. In her new life, she was surrounded by a whole sissy entourage. Mubarak's friends were always coming in and whisking her away to the orchestra, to plays. They adored her. She still cried every day, many times a day, for the first few months. And every day, she got at least one letter from Saber, sometimes two. Finally, one day, the letter that came from Saber said he'd gotten married. Mubarak, not knowing what was in the letter, gave it to Margie and went to his room. We came back out. I mean, it was five or ten minutes later. And she was still sitting there, but she had a funny look on her face. So I said, are you okay? And she started saying things like, please don't hurt me, please don't hurt me, and crying. I'm like, Margie, what are you talking about? Don't come any closer, don't come any closer, don't hurt me. And she, she didn't know who I was. She didn't know who she was. She just went out of it. Her amnesia, Mubarak calls it a vacation from the bad news, lasted several days. One, two, three. There you go. Mm -hmm. a good thing from We're in Margie's cardiologist's office and she's about to surprise me. On the last day I spend with Margie and Mubarak, she suddenly murmurs that she wishes Mubarak had gotten married. Who I wish you would have married. You wish that Mubarak would have married? Mm-hmm. Who? Mark Stoner. Now, most mothers who say, oh, I wish my gay son had gotten married, and you ask them who, they don't say a man. <laughs> there is oh, a Mark Stoner. So you don't wish Mubarak had married any girl that you know? Mm-mm. I wish he'd have married Mark Stoner. Because he was a nice guy, and he loved Mubarak a lot. Even after all the time I'd spent with her, I had completely expected her to say a woman's name. Because even though it's common when men come out as gay for their mothers to be more accepting than their fathers, there are usually at least some pretty clear limits for the mothers too. Certain ways that they're used to seeing the world and just can't give up. But Margie's world and Mubarak's are not really separate, as they are for most gay people and their parents. Mubarak is really glad she's here. He says it all the time. And he spends a lot of time with Margie. Willingly, happily. He's the only person I know who seems as unambivalent in his love for his mother as she is in her love for him. Every once in a while, he talks about something I know he thinks about a lot, which is that this is the end of Margie's life, and he's grateful that she's spending it here, where he can be with her. Okay. Margie? Mm? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. you're, you're like wobbling back and forth. Mm -hmm. Margie? Margie? Margie, talk to me. What is it, Mark? What's happening? While I was Look taping, Margie had what seemed to be a small stroke. Margie? 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 Do you want me to call 911, Mubarak? It all happened yeah. in about two minutes. Yeah. And when it was over, Margie seemed fine, although disoriented and tired. She couldn't really remember what had happened. We were more shaken than she was. Mubarak and I talked in the kitchen afterward while he made Margie some tea. It was really scary. It was so frightening. Because you know, it's so scary when you go to the hospital and she's, I remember the first time I went and she had congestive heart failure and you, and you don't know what that means. You know, you hear heart failure and you panic. And then I remembered the other two times going into the hospital and thinking it should be easier this time. But every time it happens, it gets scarier because you think you're one step closer to something really awful happening. I'm going to be a mess whenever anything really serious happens. We just did that because we knew you were going to be tape recording today. <laughs> I'm like, Margie, you think I have a little heart failure this afternoon? <laughs> just, just do what you can. I mean... I'm so scared all the time. Anyway. P.S. 
It might not be clear from this story, but I think Margie really loved Saber. I think he really loved her. We saw it clear as day in the pages of her wedding scrapbook. She turns to a picture from her wedding day. Saber's embracing Margie, and both their eyes are closed. They're smiling. They look completely happy, probably not even aware the picture is being taken. What were you thinking right at that moment when that was happening? I got that man. <laughs> He's mine now. <laughs> My mother had told me when you find the right one, you know it. And I did. Well, I thought he was the right one. Turned out he wasn't. I never did find the right one. <laughs>